So I'm Gary Gunderson. I'm from Wake Forest Baptist Health in North Carolina and also here on behalf of uh, Stakeholder Health, which is a learning group of healthcare systems all over the country. And it's my great honor to be with um, one of the systems that we've learned from and watched uh, and uh, from time to time had a chance to be with. Um, so this is the panel we've been waiting for. I'm really proud this is the very best of the day. Um, this is about our real neighborhoods, a very specific uh, opportunity to look at a system that over a long period of time has been able to sustain a commitment uh, not to this or that, but to communities that have names, neighborhoods that have names, uh, real places where not just your patients come from, but actually uh, you've had the vision to understand that's where your employees come from, where your staff comes from, and to see the, the unity of this. Uh, I'm very interested uh, in learning where you found the courage to be so smart. <laughs> and how you became smart enough to, uh, to reflect the courage that you have and the love you have for your community. Um, before we get to that, I really want to sort of hear the story a little bit. So uh, it's my honor that uh, uh, Dr. Patricia uh, de Pompeo uh, is here to uh, uh, unpack the story from your perspective as uh, the head of a children's hospital, a women's healthcare uh, center, uh, Heidi Gartland uh, is um, the vice president responsible for uh, the political side and community engagement side of this work. Couldn't be better two voices. Uh, your perspective clinically is the long-term view, beginning with the very beginning of life, uh, and the long-term uh, view of what that means for families in particular places. And you're the master of all the relationships. <laughs> that are required to be sustained to do this. So uh, with, with no more introduction to that, I'd love if you'd unpack the story a little bit. Uh, I will tell you they have a uh, PowerPoint that is gonna be in the National Academies of Science Hall of Fame, <clears throat> uh, some of which is just is too good not to use, and so I'm gonna ask you to tell the story just a little bit, and then, uh, and then we'll engage. Uh, many of us here are from particular places that we love too, and so we're going to be eager to see how we could perhaps have a story like yours someday. Great. So this is um, our tenure odyssey um, that I'm hopefully going to go through. I don't know how we manage the movement of the slides, so I don't know if I do it. Do they move? Okay. Uh, awesome. So um, just to give you a little context of our health system, um, we uh, 10 years ago did a pretty big expansion. And I will tell you that part of our journey is that we got into what our anchor work is that we'll tell you about um, in this one particular neighborhood that, um, that, whoops, okay, I'm gonna get this. All right, so the neighborhood is called the Greater University Circle area. Our hospital was founded 152 years ago in this neighborhood. And so we are of Cleveland. And um, 10 years ago, we decided we needed to reinvest in our organization, about a billion to uh, in reinvestment, of which 750 million uh, went into this particular neighborhood. And we said we had a really unique opportunity uh, when we made that decision, which was about 15 years ago. Um, we started constructing in earnest 10 years ago. And that we could just be a healthcare system investing in bricks and mortar or we could be something more. And we could invest in the community wealth building while we were investing in the health. So we started sort of with that 80%, that issue of where do you live, where do you work, where do you worship, and figuring out what did that neighborhood, um, what could we do with the neighborhood to invest in it while we were investing in sort of the normal bricks and mortar of our university hospitals health system. Why this neighborhood, the greater university circle area, you know, through disinvestment over years, um, through things like redlining and whatnot with structural barriers really to investment, structural racism, um, that we needed to really look at these neighborhoods. One in two kids were in poverty. Uh, mostly single female head of households in these neighborhoods. 
uh, about an 18,000 median um, income. Um, lots of folks that come back into reentry into these neighborhoods, um, mostly men, um, that needed work that had barriers to being able to work at a place like university hospitals. So we decided that we were going to begin um, taking this investment and um, begin working on some of the um, investments um, in the living local, hiring local, and working uh, local. And so some of the things that we did were in this publication, which I won't uh, bore you with, but it really does illustrate um, at the beginning of our odyssey. I'm going to give you a couple more slides and then turn it over to Patty de Pompe because what I think we got into, which was we thought was a one-time thing to help us build the community and then we were sort of going to extricate ourselves from this philosophy, it has now become a way of life. It's become a way that university hospitals interacts with the neighborhoods that we take care of. So this anchor strategy um, began with uh, knowing that we wanted to churn this $750 million in the local economy. We wanted to hire people from the local neighborhoods, which I'm sure we had before, but we never had really focused on specific programs to really find neighbors that were under and unemployed and to go out and find uh, their interest in working at university hospitals, which if you didn't have a computer and you didn't have a high school degree, you couldn't get a job. And so, you know, big, uh, monstrous organization, we went out and began working with local community organizations towards employment and neighborhood connections and began finding cohorts of folks that wanted to enter, have entry-level jobs at university hospitals. And we began doing uh, skills training, resume building, interview uh, training, and then began moving our very engaged workers up the career ladder because we needed to open up those entry-level jobs. So we've hired over a couple thousand people over the last five years very intentionally to come and work at university hospitals in our entry-level jobs. With that comes health benefits, other educational things to help move them and upskill them into additional jobs. So Step Up to UH is one of our programs. We've got national acclaim for about 400 folks have gone through this program. Um, and we've also began a program called Newbridge, which is a uh, program that helps us to um, train folks for phlebotomy, farm tech, nurses' aides, those kinds of things that are in-demand jobs. Um, we also uh, worked with a neighborhood cooperative that we uh, developed put a million dollars into that, put a million dollars into starting Newbridge, and now we've bought $300,000 of lettuce from this place. I mean, who could think that any place could buy $300,000 worth of lettuce? Um, but you're seeing it right there. Um, these are a lot of reentry folks, people that come out of the jails that can't get access to good paying jobs at a place like an anchor institution. So we employ them here. Uh, we also started a laundry. We have tens of millions of pounds of laundry we take uh, about a million dollars a year from our laundry cooperative and many, many other programs. Um, the other thing that we've done is looking at our neighborhoods. So these are the neighborhoods that Gary talked about. They all have names. They all have histories, you know, that go way back uh, around the time of the uh, founding of university hospitals. We now are encouraging our employees to live in these communities and so we've given over a million dollars in, in um, forgivable loans to either purchase property if they already live there to upgrade their homes um, and also to rent if they want to rent and live in these communities. We've had a couple hundred people that have now been um, citizens of our neighborhood which we love. Um, the other piece that we did was that $750 million of employment, so that buying local. Um, we very instructively decided that we were going to um, spend 80% of those dollars in the local economy. And we ended up putting that out as a big, audacious goal and ended up with 92% of that money reinvesting itself into those neighborhoods and into local businesses, both women and minority-owned businesses. So the live local, hire local, buy local was where we started. And interesting, we went upstream, and really it wasn't until about five years ago that we began working on the local health piece of it. 
Um, and I'm really excited to say that, you know, we sort of had to get the leadership, you know, so the courage you were talking about um, was doing something that our board and our leadership, and this would not have happened had it not been our CEO at the top and our board leadership, um, allowing us to invest impactfully, um, if that's a word, um, in a way that was different than where we had gone in the past. And so we fast forward with our community health work, which we have been working on with our local county board of health, Terry Allen, it was great to see you um, asking a question earlier. He has helped us through this path of equity and health. And now we are not only building bricks and mortar on our main campus, but we are really um, investing from an impact perspective locally. And I'm gonna have Patty talk about that. Thank you, Heidi, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Heidi indicated, University Hospitals has had a long-standing commitment to the community as an anchor institute. But what I'm going to share with you now over the next few minutes is our most recent investment in the community, and specifically that is toward addressing the health care needs of the babies and children and women of the most contiguous neighborhoods, the neighborhoods that you just saw a moment ago, that directly encircle the hospitals that I'm privileged to serve as president of, and that is Rainbow Babies and Children and McDonald Women's. So it started back in 2015 with our community health needs assessment. That is something that we are required to do as a healthcare um, institution. Um, historically, that had been done in a very quantitative manner. Um, we took the opportunity in 2015 to change the way we thought about our community health needs assessment and really engage the community in more of a qualitative assessment. And we heard loud and clear from the community that they were looking for other things from us um, as a health care provider. And specifically, you see them outlined here. Um, there was clearly a lack of trust. A few of our uh, speakers this morning mentioned the importance of that trusting relationship, building that relationship. And although in many regards patients and families would bring their children to us for care, it was clear on many levels that we had some work to do. In addition, they identified some other aspects to health care where they felt collectively um, throughout the community we weren't addressing those needs, specifically around behavioral and mental health needs, dental needs, thinking thoughtfully about how to engage the entire family, the multi-generational aspect, as well as the very important role of fathers. Although our hospitals are called women's hospital and babies and children's hospital, there was a clear ask to not forget the very important fathers and grandparents and uncles in the lives of the patients we served. And so we took a look at that community health needs assessment, recognized we needed more work and we engaged in that works with the community advisory board. And so Dr. Adams mentioned this in his talk this morning, that if we're going to build, truly build healthcare equity, it's clear that we have to have real partnership with the community. And so we engaged a healthcare advisory board. We reached out to a number of stakeholders in the community as well as our patients and families. And this was back in March of 2016 and asked them if they would consider partnering with us on a journey toward more effectively addressing the needs of the children and women in our community. We were absolutely astounded. We had sent out invitations, and at that initial community advisory board meeting, we had 100% attendance. This was in minus 10 degree weather with an ice storm. And it was just amazing. What it told us is that we struck a chord. That community advisory board has remained engaged with an incredible high level of participation since the beginning. And what the community advisory board said to us is could we think about delivering primary care differently? Primary care for the women and children in those neighborhoods had been delivered on the first floor of our hospital at Rainbow. That, those clinics also served as the key training ground for all the pediatric residents, of which there are 90 in our program, as well as all of the OBGYN residents. And so the ask was, could we think about that center a bit differently? And so we did. We engaged the existing patients and families from the Rainbow Ambulatory Practice and the McDonald Women's and Children's OBGYN Service 
reached out to them. We also reached out to the providers for those services and said if you could design your ideal model of primary care delivery, what would that look like? We had very strong response. Like we saw with the Community Advisory Board, we had 80% response to the survey that was sent out. And what families told us loud and clear is, can you do things a little bit differently? Our providers also told us, we understand addressing the social determinants are important, but help us understand how we can fit that in with very busy clinic schedules. As you can see, and again, no surprise based on our conversations this morning, what we heard from the patients and families we partner with for their care is that housing was a significant need for them. The red are the respondents from our pediatric practice. The yellow are the respondents from our women's clinic. You could see they're not so differently. But overwhelmingly, families were feeling very unsure about their housing stability. They recognized that they had grave concerns about ability to pay their bills. And this is what the population of which about 85% of our families are employed. The issue is that they had been employed in lower paying jobs. They had issues related to food insecurity. There was no local supermarket within the most contiguous neighborhoods. They had issues with transportation. It was difficult getting to our clinic located on the first floor. There was no direct bus line to that clinic. So we took all of this information and decided to make a different type of investment. But we made it very clear we didn't want to build something just for the sake of building another pretty bricks and mortar building. We wanted to build something that would address the needs that we heard were quite striking. And so uh, our patients and families told us, please partner with us, not just on addressing our specific health care needs, but can you help think thoughtfully about addressing those social determinant needs? And again, you could see very strong response, very consistent with the survey that we had ran previously. We took all of that data, we partnered with our community advisory board, and we got to work designing a center that we believe and we're very hopeful can do just that. So what you see depicted is our uh, new Rainbow Center for Women and Children. It opened in July of this year. Of note, the building was funded completely through philanthropic support and a, and a combination of new market tax credits. So we were able to build the building doing that. But in addition, philanthropically, we raised significant dollars to support the programs that we know in this field of it's still somewhat fee for service we haven't evolved the model we were going to need support in doing so until we could demonstrate the effectiveness the business case for that the center is warm it's welcoming the community advisory board and instructed us and partnered with us on every aspect of the building the artwork in the building is all reflective of local artists it's a busy vibrant center um, we see thousands of patient visits in fact we're so busy, we had to, in addition to the bus stops, the additional bus stops we added, we're going to be adding some additional flat surface parking um, next door because we were rapidly um, seeing more visits than we had anticipated, which is a good thing. But within the center, we've addressed the primary care pediatric needs, OBGYN needs. We also have maternal fetal medicine because we care for a population of women who are at very high risk but we also added dental offertories. So we have services for both women and children there. We also have eye care. When we um, reached out to our Cleveland Municipal School District, we realized many of the children in our district had significant vision issues, so we incorporated that. We were able to receive support from a local law firm so that we could support a, a medical legal partnership. So we have legal aid on site five days a week. We moved our WIC program right into the center. Um, we added behavioral mental health services and we're very, very pleased to receive support from generous members of the community who had been personally impacted by mental health issues and knew that was such a, an important cause. We also have a very robust contraceptive program there. We also have a very strong addiction service program. 
And I, I was sharing with Heidi, it was very interesting. We welcomed an executive leadership group from a local company who's recently co-located to the area. And many of the executives in the group um, said, we wish we would have had such a center in our suburb. So I know one of our earlier speakers mentioned we need to think thoughtfully about as we address the needs of the underserved in our community, they may not be so different from the needs of people in suburbs who are looking for that same degree of access and how can we leverage that to make the business case. And that, now I'll turn it back to Gary, and, and we're happy to open it for questions. So, Patty, let me ask you to keep the microphone for a little bit. Um, I know as a senior executive, you are in the small rooms where really tough conversations take place regularly, that these institutions that look like they have lots and lots of money functionally operate on very, very thin margins. And so you must you must have been in conversations throughout this time about there just isn't isn't the money to be to be as entirely not for profitable <laughs> as as our as our public image may wish to look how do you how do you make the argument inside those small tables uh, where do you find the budget slack where do you find the the budget courage to create the options to do these kind of creative stuff? That's an excellent question. I can remember vividly the day when I approached our executive team um, as well as our board and said we need to do something different. And um, that's where it comes down to what is the mission of your organization? It has to be core to your mission. So that was clear. There was no question. We were committed to caring and partnering around the care of babies, children, and, and women in our community. But our payer mix for this particular clinic is 91% Medicaid insured on the pediatric side, 90% on the women's side. So the business case proposition was a challenge because the, the reimbursement um, is very poor, as we know, for primary care services. That is exactly why we went to members of our community who we know would get it. We shared with them statistics on the absolutely unacceptable disparity we saw in life ex expectancy for an African-American baby born, for example, in the neighborhoods that Heidi pointed out versus a Caucasian baby born in a neighborhood just eight miles away. We shared with them information that Terry and our, our, our county board had provided to us relative to the absolutely unacceptable disparity in African-American infant mortality compared to Caucasian mortality. And everyone said, we need to do something, and we are willing to invest in that. That is why it was so important to make this program go. We needed to ensure that we had funding for the capital component. We had never utilized new market tax credits at university hospitals. It was our friends from Robert Wood Johnson who encouraged us to think about that. It was that combination of new market tax credits and philanthropic support that enabled the building to get done. It was the generosity of our community, both public, private foundations, as well as the governmental sector. I must say the Ohio Department of Medicaid has also funded many of our programs because we have demonstrated their success. Within this building now, we have room for group models of care delivery, so we have a very robust centering pregnancy program. The rates of preterm delivery for women enrolled in our centering pregnancy program compared to women in the same community who weren't enrolled are significantly different. Only 3.8% of the women in our centering pregnancy program this year have delivered prematurely. And this is from a very high-risk population compared to over 14% in our community at large. And so we, we coupled all of those sources of funding together to make the program run. But it doesn't mean that we're not thinking thoughtfully about how do we drive more efficiency in the center? How can we drive more volume through, right? So to make sure that we can cover the cost and cover the overhead expense of doing that. But it's a, it's a wonderful and a joyous challenge to have. So tell me a little bit more about the new market tax credit. Uh, that's not something we're utilizing uh, locally. Uh, how'd that work? Sure. So this was a pretty exciting uh, thing for us to even uh, go after. Our board, of course, you talk about courage and, and leadership. Our board had to 
allow us to develop um, sort of the legal structures and the financial wherewithal to take that on. Um, we put together a proposal. We put it out to the you know, CDFIs and the uh, CDAs. And I will tell you that they were so excited to be involved in this project. And I think the gentleman from LISC was talking about this hunger out there to have very socially responsible projects. When you look at new market tax credits, you have to have an economically distressed area. Um, in order for the new market tax credits, I guess you get a higher weight the lower income, um, less resourced area. We happen, not knowing, um, to pick probably the highest um, uneconomically resourced area in the entire uh, Northeast Ohio area. So, so we had similar, competition. That's similar like a really poor area. Like a really yeah, poor okay. area. Like, the, like there was a food desert, a health desert, an economic desert. Now you wouldn't know that today after having built this. This is an anchor institution that now there is this entire investment that with a food um, store and with other economic developments. Um, but our, you know, it was um, about a seven and a half million dollars that of the $26 million building that we received new market tax credits. And again, it was a risk, but it was a calculated risk. And I will say that, again, our leadership at the top of the organization, Patty, um, has always been able to deliver on the projects and promises that she has made. And so they trusted the leader in putting this together. And I think um, the fact that it was a new uh, thing for Cleveland and a new way to invest now, I think other people are beginning to look at this as an opportunity. I don't know, Patty, if you have anything else. No, Heidi summed it up beautifully, but I, I can't underestimate um, the importance of thinking of new market tax credits as a catalyst for economic growth. So that's a prerequisite. There's an assumption that it's not just about building this primary center, but that as a result of building it, we would see growth. And Heidi referenced it. There's a brand new, beautiful grocery store that is going to be built directly adjacent to our new center, it's opening in April, and we're doing a lot of co-located nutritional programming. There's a new coffee shop that opened up across the street that the staff at the center are ecstatic, but our patients and families are too. That wasn't available to them. There's a new IT firm, startup firms that are going into the building immediately adjacent to us, and we were proud to partner with a number of key stakeholders to make that growth happen so that it truly we did serve as a catalyst for growth in that corridor. Yeah, so Patty, let me unpack that a little bit. So apparently you are both still employed, um, having taken these risks, but I, I really heard a, a, a very important um, phrase not to, not to skip over. You delivered on promises, and, and both of you have had a reputation of delivering on promises to your internal stakeholders, your other colleagues whose jobs also depend on your success and on your community that looks to you uh, when you make a promise that you actually fulfill it. So the question I'm trying to get to is how much of the, how much of the change that you see around you is, is something that you feel like you had to make happen and how much of it you now see in the momentum of the successes that others want to partner in. In other words, you don't have to make everything happen. You just have to fulfill your promises, and others may come alongside you. I, I would say strongly the latter, that you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to deliver on the promises, first and foremost, that we make to our patients and families. And ultimately, that is, we want to see every baby live and grow and thrive. We want to see every woman have a successful and a healthy pregnancy. So those are kind of the preliminary, those are our promises. On a, as an executive, I have to deliver on the promises that we're meeting all of our regulatory requirements, that our P&L is what we said, which by the way, we budget for an operating loss. So we know that, but it can't exceed that. I have to be very fiscally responsible that way. But then the community, was primed. We, we are part of a, a very vibrant community that wants to see Cleveland rise and do better by the residents. And so it's not all about us. It truly is about that partnership that Heidi articulated early. You know, with the Greater University Circle, with Cuyahoga County, with the City of Cleveland, we view ourselves as just one 
of the very important, but just one of the team members. It's about the entire community. One thing I would just add, and that is that it is a journey because we wouldn't have gotten to the agreement to build this center in this very economically distressed community um, had we not started with Vision 2010 and our investment in bricks and mortar and knowing that investing in the community gave us an investment back, meaning that, you know, that wealth building and, and the employment base increasing. But the second thing is, is that, again, delivering on promises, we had a, um, one of the first Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Grants, the CMMI project, that was about a $12 million investment that CMMI made early in Rainbow back in 2012 to innovate on a total cost of care model, which we've heard about as well, looking at population health. We had a very big decision as to when we were going to put that office for our CMMI opportunity. Where were we going to put it? And our doctors, you know, we had just gone into this live local, buy local, hire local. We really hadn't looked at health local quite yet in the way we are mm. now. And they were going to go into the suburbs and put that CMMI office close to where they lived. And we challenged them and said, you know what? Patty and I said, well, that might be nice for you, but if this is about the people that we're taking care of, let's figure out where to put it. And literally, it's about a block and a half from where our new Rainbow Center is. And they put that in 2012. The doctors were like, ooh, I haven't really been in that neighborhood. That was a difficult sort of mindset. Now, that helped when the other doctors that were going to move to this new center five years later um, began to move there. And it provided that first seed of understanding where place matters and that health and place are very intertwined for what we do and getting them outside of that institutional sort of mindset and getting it into the neighborhood. So I, I don't even know, you know, in hindsight, whether we would have gotten uh, there without having that sort of intermediate. So there was a government private public partnership that helped us maybe that we haven't quite fully um, vetted. So I want to open it up for questions here. You've really laid out about a billion different hooks for follow-up questions. Lots of technical detail I've heard of what you're doing. Uh, lots of personal courage in what you're doing. Um, as uh, questions sort of come to the microphone, I want to ask an educational question <clears throat> in that you train hundreds of residents, uh, uh, young professionals coming into the field um, how do you think they're learning something different watching the executive behavior, not just clinical behavior, but executive behavior of your institution? Well, it's interesting. Something I hadn't thought about was the importance of such a center as a recruitment tool for the best and brightest across the country. And so we have residents who come to us who are really excited. One thing I didn't mention, we also have a program that we call Rainbow Care Connects where we engage um, students from the community um, around um, surveying the families who come into us around social determinants of health. And there's warm handoffs that are made to the respective social agencies. And there's a robust database. And there's lots of metrics that we're gathering. So for residents who are seeking their training, who get it, they understand the importance of it's not just about the care delivery that I'm delivering as a physician or as a nurse practitioner or a nurse midwife. If we can't address those social determinants, we're not going to move the needle. And so inherently, they got it probably quicker than those of us who are older got it. And so it's, it has served as an amazing recruitment tool. And I hadn't thought about that in the beginning, honestly. Super. Let's take some questions. Sandy? Sandy Magnan, uh, thank you so much for your leadership and for your sharing your story uh, with us. So if I could wave a magic wand and give you a wish list for the holidays, a policy wish list for the holidays that I'm going to send to Medicaid, your biggest payer. What policy change, what system change would you wish for on your holiday list? Sure. Um, and we have a new governor coming into our state, so I'm going to share this with the, our new governor, so when they pick their new Medicaid director, maybe they'll, maybe if you send it and I send it, we'll get it. Um, so we have Medicaid managed care, which has totally enveloped our entire, both chronically ill as well as our healthy population. 
And the CMMI grant that we got, which was total cost of care um, to develop innovative models for population health, really showed amazing impact. Being able to translate that into five separate contracts for total cost of care becomes really difficult because you've got payers that are more enlightened and payers that are less enlightened. And when you're trying to change the entire way you're delivering care to a population, you get really schizophrenic when you've got, you know, one half of your payers being willing to make model care change, and yet you have to make that change for the entire population, but you may not get financially rewarded because, right, Patty has to meet a budget at the end of the, the day. So I think that if there's no better risk than to take on women and children, which are, you know, sort of the beginning of life, I would say to our Medicaid director, how can we develop something that they help us to get a much more um, uh, coordinated contractual arrangement? I know they're not going to come in and get in between us and the contractor, but there are some policy things they could do to incentivize them to be much more aligned with the things that we think do actually save money and then for us to share in that savings, because the other piece that I will say is managed care isn't often willing to give back the dollars that they give back, um, you know, that they get at the end of the day. So I think that, that would be a payer. I don't know, Patty, if you have other ideas. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. If, if we think about this model, and I mentioned the example of our Centering Pregnancy Program, which really was the vision of our nurse midwives who had this great idea. And the state responded because they've seen the cost savings on the reduction in the neonatal intensive care unit admissions. I would like to see that replicated 10, 15 fold. There's so many examples, as we all know, of things that if you do it right upstream and you execute effectively, we can so reduce the downstream spend, but it has to be a sustainable model. And the only way it's going to be that way is if policy changes across the board to sustain to support those primary care interventions. So if, uh, if you want a reference for the idea about coordinating contracting in some way, so it's a line, my fam and Ginsburg just wrote a new, um, I forgot, new era of payment reform that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, so. I'll send that to our new Medicaid director. Oh, and send our reference, thank you. Thanks, Annie. Over here. Hi, Alex Rossidi, Social Impact Exchange. Gary, it's good to see you. Thank you so much. This is a, just a fantastic example of the kind of partnering for hospitals and community. So uh, just a few questions just to round out sort of an understanding of it. Um, size of the county, you know, what's the population, or the circle, say. Um, more importantly, you've, sounds like you've grown the volume at Rainbow. So. I'm curious as to whether or not you're at that point where you can make or when you think you'll be able to make the economic argument, look, we have increased volume or revenue at a certain level. Certainly the downstream savings are going to impact the economic picture for you. So, but, so the business case, are you starting, you may not have recouped the investment in the, in the capital structure. So the business case has a coming and then what outcomes, health outcomes, and population level outcomes are you looking to achieve in time frames? Obviously, these, some of these things don't happen immediately. Some of them can happen more quickly. Lower NICU, you know, sorts of things, uh, et cetera. And then I do have one last question after that about are you getting to be a gravitational pull? Sort of Gary's point, you don't necessarily have to start out by bringing the entire world into the circle, but are you starting to be a gravitational pull for businesses or, or policy work so that they, re they really say, hey, we can invest a billion dollars into the circle kind of thing? Um, so I'm sorry I had so many questions, but it's such a fascinating model. Well, I'll, answer, I'll try to answer some of the numbers, and then I'll turn it to Patty to talk about the, the metrics and the, and the population. Um, so our county is about a million. Um, our city, however, is about 350 to 400,000 people, and we are one of the most densely populated portions, so Terry, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's probably, Greater University Circle is probably a little less than 200,000 of that city population. It's very populated on the east side with mostly African American, 
and then populated on the west side with mostly Caucasian and Hispanic. It's a very segregated city, unfortunately, for us. Um, and um, as it, I, I will tell you one thing about gravitational pull, and that is um, I think university hospitals and partnering with the County Board of Health and the City Board of Health in developing our community health needs assessments jointly. So in 2018, one thing that I didn't talk about is we have a requirement in 2020 in our state to do needs assessments jointly with our cities and county health departments um, and to align in terms of um, various uh, things that we're gonna work on together. Well, we did this with university hospitals about a year or two ahead of that schedule. And so the gravitational pull, I will say, is that the rest of the health systems now have all begun. We just had a big sort of unveiling um, for us. Um, so UH really sort of is that force with the county and the city to get our other brethren um, to align. We all were like, you know, two-year-olds sitting in the sandbox, you know, playing, you know, right next to each other, not really sharing toys. And now we're starting to begin sharing those toys together. And that, I think, where we compete on patient care, we shouldn't be competing on um, community health, so I will say that that has been one really evolutionary thing for me from a gravitational pull that this anchor work, fast forward 10 years later, really is now embedded itself in healthcare. You know, it's workspace, economic, and yes, the businesses are trying to move anywhere UH is because they know when we sit our stakes down that we stay and we continue to invest in those um, bricks and mortar things. So. I will say from an economic perspective, yes, that, that is happening. From a healthcare delivery perspective, there's very basic metrics that we established early. So um, remember I said we opened in July. So some of our initial metrics were we wanted to see great year-over-year -year growth. So on an annualized basis, the center would see 45,000 patient visits. As a requirement of our new market tax credits, we had to put um, in a factor for additional growth. So 5% volume growth is one of those things that we're tracking. Um, in addition, there were some basic things like show rate. Our show rate for our pediatric clinic and our women's health clinic was poor, which isn't uncommon with clinics that are, are predominantly insured through Medicaid, but we knew we could do better. And in fact, we're seeing that, and we believe the ease of access, the respect that patients feel when they walk through the doors has already made a significant difference in our show rates for both women's and children's services. The healthcare metrics we looked at were things that were built into our original CMMI awards, so we looked at um, inpatient admissions for pediatric psychiatry visits. If we could address behavioral and mental health ambulatory visits, could we reduce the need for emergent inpatient admissions to our pediatric psychiatric unit? Um, if we could ensure that every child had fluoride varnish applied at the eruption of their first molar, could we reduce the rate of surgical intervention needed for children with untreated dental caries? Our baseline level, almost 10% of the children we saw for initial evaluation required not just drilling for cavities, but out and out anesthesia with full-scale surgical intervention. So we're tracking those numbers. Things like immunization rate, um, uh, uh, ability for women to access LARC for those who cho chose to do so. Um, we have a number of metrics that we're tracking. Some are short-term, others go out three and five years. And you're optimistic? I'm very optimistic. The initial indicators, I, I have been accused of being an eternal optimist, but the initial indicators are incredibly promising. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks. Mark Garavich with Department of Population Health here at NYU and member of the Roundtable. Great presentation. You're really describing a, uh, it's sounding like a case of doing well by doing good. And I'm wondering about scale. You described your board and, and leadership as mission-driven. That's really what, what, uh, what, what contributed to the uh, initiation of this effort. It's working for the system now. Can you make the case to uh, the assembled boards and CEOs uh, around the land who are less mission-driven, let's say, uh, that this is the right thing to do from their bottom line or from a business and from a forward-looking perspective, uh, 
on its own merits, or do you need to uh, keep it a two-pronged uh, justification? So I'll start. Um, I, I will say that I think that we are, even within our own uh, internal health system, we have other areas like the Greater University Circle where we have other hospitals with footprints around them that are equally distressed. And so we are in our Lorraine County, which is a county adjacent to, to Cuyahoga. We have a hospital there that we are doing very similar sorts of work right around that hospital. We have another that sits near um, in Cuyahoga County, actually, but right adjacent to a very low-income area. And so we are taking very place-based approaches rather than sort of peanut butter, meaning that just taking our project and spreading it across our system, we are taking it and very strategically saying, this is a community that can do that same sort of step up to UH program, but let's do that in Lorraine. Let's do that in Southern Cuyahoga County. Um, we are also part of a number of organizations that are trying to spread this anchor work. So Root Cause Coalition, um, which ProMedica actually started, we were very much uh, a part of their inaugural group of, of uh, hospitals very much involved in that. The Hospital Anchor Network, um, which is another group. We've certainly followed stakeholder health and the work that they have done. So I think that there are a number of organizations out there. We're not the only one. I mean, I'm humble enough to say that we are one, um, but there are others that are doing this um, good work out there, and I think that, that that it does take leadership at the very top. It's not going to, unfortunately, this kind of work doesn't bubble up from the bottom. It really has to be both and. Um, and I think that um, the fact that we've had a, a CEO that has been very committed to this from the beginning, and you're right, because we've done well, um, and we've had community engagement, and that's part of my job um, that has come from this, has been a real um, a sister to many of our other projects than things that are, well, not part of this sort of social mission, but other parts of our mission as well that have helped us in other business uh, categories. So, John, I want to call on you. And, and Terry, I want to give you a little heads up. If it's not violating um, uh, oversight uh, lines, I'd be curious about how you see this model as the local health officer, John. Well, great, great work and, and really inspiring work. Um, one thing I wonder about um, whether it's it's been a part of the uh, the the planning activities has been um, looking at uh, job creation, um, job training opportunities, the creation in particular of career ladders for people in the community that may not have, say, a training and in healthcare or uh, linkages to the schools in the neighborhood. Um, I was previously involved in a project like this and we really struggled in, uh, to, to do that and, and heard a lot from the community that those were, ho those were uh, hopes that from the community that we'd be able to address. Your thoughts? I, I can't speak to the center. So uh, again, part of new, new market tax credits, you have to stipulate the number of new jobs that you will create. And we made a commitment from the very beginning, not only with the jobs ongoing in the center, but also with the initial construction jobs that we would hire locally. The challenge sometimes with that is for members of the community, you could have positions open, but there may be barriers that they face, and we know the, the realities of that. And that is why the Step Up to UH program has been so important that for many uh, residents in our local communities, the ability to get a step in the door, to have an entry level job is one thing, but then we're committed to ongoing workforce training so that, that individuals can continue to rise up in the ranks, attain higher paying jobs, open up those entry level openings for more members from the community. So that has been absolutely core to our commitment to this. And that's working? That's, you're seeing evidence that that is succeeding? Yes. Yeah, I, I will add a couple of things. So we've done a Bridge to Your Future program. So once we had to open up all those entry-level jobs for Step Up, we then developed a program where we knew a lot of the barrier for our folks to move up was they needed a certificate of some sort. They needed some other thing. About 65% of our employees have to have some sort of certificate, bachelor, uh, associate's degree, or some sort of other technical training in order to do their jobs. 
So we developed programs with our local community colleges specifically because we opened up that Step Up to UH program. And so I would say from UH's perspective, we have begun investing in a way that's very different, our HR leadership. And again, this is now owned by HR. It might have been something that we developed at the beginning of our Vision 2010 as like a theory, but now it's incorporated into how we do business. And I think that um, that, that has been, again, from an engagement perspective, um, our uh, folks, once they did the step up, were very hesitant to take these workers from the local community because their turnover rate had been like 80%. Um, once we put them with a job coach, and you know, part of the reason people don't stay in a job is because they might have that life thing where like we all have a backup plan to the backup plan, and they're just one you know, child sick episode from not showing up to work and not thinking to call and therefore getting fired. So there was this job coach that really was a component where now our turnover rate is something like 16 to 18%. And our employer managers love it now because they know these are the sticky people. They stay in the jobs because they've got somebody that's helping them stay in the job. And we know it costs two times the salary to replace a turnover worker than it does to keep somebody. So they see the cost benefit of that as well. Thank you. Super. Terry, let me ask you to question or comment. Thanks, Gary. So uh, uh, Patty and uh, Heidi, I think um, first I would say they're really, it's, it's a leadership issue and it's a behavior modeling opportunity. Uh, we are um, amidst this uh, uh, statutory requirement for this alignment that, uh, that uh, you heard about uh, coordinating health assessments across multiple systems uh, across the state of Ohio. And I think it's a, I think it's a, real, a real opportunity for us. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty as we go forward, working with our, locally with our regional hospital association uh, here, thinking more regionally because of the reach of the systems, which is uh, an issue as the state has required county level assessments and, and often the, uh, the dynamics of how systems are set up don't necessarily uh, work uh, at those strict borders. But, but I've, what I've appreciated is, is uh, UH's support to work through those uh, uh, challenges in order to coordinate as we not only conduct the assessment work in a two-step process in order to align with the IRS cycles of multiple systems, which is a heavy lift, but also as we think about a movement toward, toward health improvement in the community and the priorities that emerge and new conversations that are taking place heretofore never have across multiple systems. And I think that's the exciting piece. The other thing I will say also is, is the, uh, the people that are in the room often uh, have a lot to do with the success of the conversation and, and their approach to the discussion and the authority they have to make decisions in the context of those discussions. And so there's a person in particular, Danielle Price, who comes from the community, who works for UH and has a very much a health equity focus from a personal experience and from, from, uh, from, a, uh, from a principle and, and a belief uh, system uh, uh, standpoint that really is helping uh, to engage the conversation and assure that we're deciding about how to best use those resources to begin to, to uh, um, uh, acknowledge the compounding disadvantages that a subset of the population deals with in under-resourced communities and making sure that, that the equity pieces is firm in our health improvement partnership work going forward. And that, that uh, reinforcement across, uh, the, across the many hospitals that exist in a, in a, in a, you know, in a county uh, and, and in a region helps, I think, to ground the work to assure that we're always going back to equity as a guiding principle. So I think, um, I think it's, an, it's an exciting time. There's a, lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of hope for the future. And I think leadership is at the center of it. So I thank uh, Heidi and, uh, and Patty for being here to share the story. Thank you, Terry. I'm glad we've got that on the record, actually. Uh, we can't, we can't um, report on something that wasn't said. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, Bobby? Uh, Bobby Melcina, member of the roundtable. Um, you, you know, often competition among healthcare providers is cited as the, as the reason or the sticking point for inaction. And, you know, you've, you've spoken about a very compelling place-based orientation. There are other actors in the sandbox there, and I'm wondering if you can, if you've seen, or if this has been going on long enough, to see changes in their orientation to sort of 
adjust to a new kind of, um, new kind of uh, focus on the whole population, or if it's altered your um, sense of competition with Metro Health or Cleveland Clinic and other groups in the, organ in the area. You can. Okay. Um, so yes, I would say that we have been, so in this 10-year odyssey, um, in the greater university circle is Case Western Reserve University, is the Cleveland Clinic, is University Hospitals. Metro Health sits on the west side, so they've been less part of that particular GUC work. Um, I will say one place, and I actually happen to chair the Center for Health Affairs, which is our local hospital association of all the hospitals in Northeast Ohio. So I've had a very um, unique role to be in a position to sort of compel collaboration, but you can't really compel collaboration, really. I mean, you can really set the table and hope everybody comes to it. And that is our one convening place. We do work on our needs assessments through that organization with the health departments. And uh, one area that we have worked on is our infant mortality area collectively um, through our um, first year Cleveland. Patty actually chairs that um, through Northeast Ohio with Akram Boutros, who's the president of Metro Health. Um, we also developed a Northeast Ohio opioid collaborative. So we're beginning to sit in a space and work together um, in areas that are very substantially important for the community health. Um, obviously, the FTC and DOJ will not allow us to sit in a room together and talk about how are we actually going to deliver the core pieces of our business, and that's you know a legal issue. But from the public health pieces of it, I think that this uh, work with the anchor mission and then fast forward to some of the work that our local hospital association has done with the health departments um, is really, I think, we're at the beginning. And I mentioned we started with the live local, hire local, work local. We don't compete. I mean, we compete somewhat in that area, but we don't compete. So we waited until really 2015, 2016 to even get into that local health piece of it. I think UH was more of a, um, we maybe put our foot forward first, but everybody is now working, I think, um, much better collaboratively. So it's not perfect, um, and I don't think it ever will be, but I think that we have a lot more trust even amongst ourselves. I remember I've been at university hospitals for 25 years, and our two previous CEOs said, you may never dial a number that starts with 216444. And that was the number of you know the other organization in Cleveland that we couldn't even talk about. And I, and I feared that maybe like she would get a list of all of the numbers that I called, so I literally never did it. And this was in the day before cell phones, really. So it's not that way anymore. And our CEOs do sit in a table together, um, and they meet regularly, which I think is also important about uh, servant leadership to the community. I would add there's an adage um, that we steal shamelessly from each other, and that was something that was shared with me actually by Dr. Boutros. I just hosted our first year Cleveland committee meeting at the new center, and um, colleagues from all healthcare organizations came, and that was said to me, you know we're going to steal shamelessly, and I said I hope you do so, because collectively if it works, we want to replicate it. It's about better health. I think that's actually a great last word. Um, I'm honored to have been on the, uh, this platform with you and look forward to visiting Cleveland and seeing on the ground these neighborhoods that I can hear in your voice, I can hear in your work, the long witness uh, of the love you have for the people of Cleveland. So thank you. What a great model. And we'll stop now. I think we have a break now until 1.15. It's lunch on your own. Uh, and the, the afternoon is really going to culminate into a, a, a similar kind of organizational spotlight uh, with U.S. Trust and Bank of America on how they're changing orientation to business investment. And then comes the leadership uh, role play at the end of the day. So be back at 115 sharp.